Thanks everybody for joining us. I'm Jane with the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center. We're here to talk about AAC today, augmentative and alternative communication, if I got that right. Um, for those of you who don't know CPAC, we're the Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center. And I wanna tell you a little bit about us. We call ourselves CPAC instead of Connecticut Parent Advocacy Center. And we are Connecticut's Parent Training and Information Center under the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. It is our philosophy that parents make the best advocates for their children. And therefore our mission is to educate, support and empower Connecticut's diverse families of children and youth with disability or any chronic condition, ages birth to 26 and the professionals who serve them. All of our staff are also parents of children who have a disability. Um, as such, we like to remind everyone that this is a public forum. And if you do have children to be conscious of their privacy and that we do have a phone center that's free for families. If you do have individual concerns, we're happy to take those on a one-to-one -one basis. But for today, if we can ask some group questions or things that will benefit the group, we'd love to have an active discussion. Our presenters are Nicole Natali and EJ Piccarillo from CREC. And I'm gonna turn the floor over to them. Thanks so much, Jane. Welcome everybody. Uh, like Jane said, um, I'm Nicole Natali. I am a speech language pathologist and assistive technology practitioner. And I work for CREC and travel throughout the state, mostly in the Hartford region, providing augmentative and alternative communication assessments, intervention, training, and technical assistance, um, as well as assistive technology. And here is EJ. Hey everybody, uh, my name is EJ Piccarillo. I am also a speech and language pathologist and education specialist with CREC. And like Nicole said, I have a very similar role to her. Um, I travel all throughout the state providing assistive technology and AAC training and support, technical assistance and assessments to school districts all over Connecticut. So we're, oh, go ahead, EJ, sorry about that. <laughs> Our goals for today, um, we do want this to be as interactive and engaging as possible. Uh, there will be times where we will pose some questions to the audience. Feel free to please either uh, answer in the chat or uh, unmute yourself and, and participate that way. Uh, we hope that by the end of today's session, you'll be able to uh, define AAC and all the different types of AAC. There are a lot and we'll go through them. Um, we're going to be dispelling some common myths regarding AAC, so we'll, we'll hopefully clear up some, some um, misconceptions there. And um, there's a lot of content to get through, um, and unfortunately, we don't have enough time to, to dive into everything in great detail. Uh, so we have included links to some resources uh, that we hope you will refer to to further your knowledge in AAC. And please feel free to raise your hand, um, to at, use the raise hand function in, under participants, um, unmute, um, or just drop a question in the chat if you have any. So we wanted to start off this presentation by talking about communication and anything pretty much you see that is underlined here in blue um, for the most part is a link um, to a resource. So EJ has posted the slide deck on our chat. So feel free to look at it later on and we're not going to get to everything, but there's a, a lot of resources in there. Um, but this is the Communication Bill of Rights. And we wanted to start here just to ensure um, that everybody knows that we believe and that our students, our children have the right to communicate independently um, and across a broad variety of functions and in a a variety of um, environments. Um, we believe that individuals have the right to socialize, to make their own choices, to comment, um, and the list keeps going. Um, our communication act should be responded to, um, whether it's through AAC or any other type of communication. Um, we believe that communication should be provided to all and should be equitable for all individuals. And of course, I just paraphrased many of these, but we wanna always make sure that we talk about the whole reason why we're here, especially as speech language pathologists is for independent communication for our students. 
So um, we'll get into this in, in a couple of slides, but the, the big idea um, that, that AAC is kind of grouped under is assistive technology. Um, for anyone who this term might be new to, um, or just a little refresher, um, assistive technology is part of IDEA, right? The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act, the law that governs special education. Um, it's actually written into IDEA. And um, the definition is any item, piece of equipment, or product system, it can be acquired by, by being purchased, um, modified or customized, and it's used to increase, maintain, or improve the functional capabilities of a child with a disability. Uh, assistive technology in terms of uh, the school setting does not include a medical device that's surgically implanted, such as a cochlear implant, or the replacement of such device. And the reason we wanted to, before we even do the next part, talk about AT is because assistive technology in general is a really broad umbrella of potential tools and strategies and techniques. We are specifically talking today about assistive technology for communication. So that is augmentative and alternative communication. So there are times when actually EJ and I will get a referral and it will say it's an assistive technology eval or, or the team wants assistive technology supports when oftentimes um, they're also looking for or are looking for supports just for augmentative and alternative communication, which is one part of assistive technology. So we always wanted to clarify that. Um, so either raise your hand or drop in the chat before we even talk about the formal definition of augmentative and alternative communication. What does it mean to you? What is your definition of AAC? And if I'm looking at the sides, because I have my other monitor up too to monitor the chat. Just curious what it what AAC means to those people attending. I'll go. Um, a means for someone who may not be able to verbalize and communicate. Excellent. Yep, a way to communicate. Great, a way for people to communicate that not might not be able to verbalize. Great, yep, a way to communicate wants and needs. Excellent. Nicole, Before I don't know we go, okay. see, but Jen had her hand raised. Oh, thank you. No, I couldn't. Go like ahead, Jen. Do that for your view, I will do that for you. I appreciate it. Yes, I, I can't even see on my, my iPad all the participants are trying to, but go ahead, Jen. Jen, are you having trouble unmuting? Was it Jen from CPAC, Jen, or a different Jen? Yeah, it was Jen from CPAC. You want to just go have Nicole move on, Jen? OK. Yeah, OK. <laughs> yep. And so I, I also see in the, the chat, uh, Susan wrote, um, social interaction is possible um, through AAC. And that's true. So I did want to just elaborate, because I don't believe in this uh, presentation, but we'll make sure to add it that EJ and I even really mention the four main reasons we communicate. Um, and so Karen um, indicated that AAC helps us communicate wants and needs, and that's absolutely true. Um, but that is just actually one reason why we communicate. And we'll put um, down in the resources at the very bottom, the four main reasons. But wants and needs are just one little part of communication. We also communicate um, in order to transfer information. So in order to, to answer questions, to talk about the weather, to tell people your name or your um, emergency information. We also talk about um, social etiquette. So that is the, those are the um, communication attempts we make um, to really be um, just members of society. Please, thank you, hi, how are you? Um, those types of communication that we use in order to be participating in communication. And then the fourth main reason we communicate, which AAC allows us to do, is social closeness, which is um, to be able to initiate and maintain social interactions. 
And I would say probably out of all four, um, I see a lot of wants and needs um, getting completed in the schools for AAC, you know, requesting um, or talking about pain at, or, or what a student needs, which is very important. But we also need to work on those other three um, reasons why we communicate as well. And we'll make sure we put a resource in there for you all about that. Any questions about that? The four main reasons we communicate? Okay. No hands, we're good. So more of a formal definition, which um, the American Speech and Hearing Association uh, defines AAC as, that's ASHA, that's the governing body for speech and language pathologists and audiologists. They define AAC as an area of clinical practice that addresses the needs of individuals with significant and complex communication disorders. And those disorders are characterized by speech and language impairments um, in either the production or comprehension of speech and language. And this includes spoken and written modes of communication. And the definition goes on. On our next slide, we have the second part. Yep, but I did just wanna point out um, this definition was revised probably a number of years ago now to talk about comprehension and understanding. A lot of people associate AAC with just expression, um, but it also has to do with helping students understand words and understand language as well. So we have some students who aren't even necessarily using AAC per se for verbal communication, but are using visual supports and pictures and symbols to help understanding. And that's considered AAC. Uh, so AAC uses a variety of techniques and tools. There's a, a ton of different ways that AAC can present, um, including picture communication boards. We see those a lot. Um, line drawings, our good old SGDs, the speech generating devices, um, objects you can, you can actually touch and hold, uh, manual signs and sign language, gestures and body language and finger spelling. All of these things um, are different forms of AAC and they're all um, they all have a, have a place depending on you know what kind of user you you are and or you have, um, and like Nicole said, right, the the purpose and the different ways that we might use AAC or to express uh, our thoughts and transfer information to get our wants and needs met, and to to express our feelings and ideas. So I don't think we've covered the, the actual acronym um, in terms of what it means. The, the augmentative and the alternative do have slightly different meanings that, that make up you know, the A and the A and the AAC. The augmentative refers to um, what, what supplements existing speech. So the user might still um, you know, use their voice um, or their, their, their language to communicate, but they might require AAC or use AAC to supplement their voice. And the alternative refers to something that's, that, that replaces speech and that because that speech is, is either absent or not functional. And the last piece here is that AAC does not have to be permanent. Um, AAC can be temporary or part-time. For example, if a, a patient has surgery and they're, they're post-op in the ICU and they're not able to use their voice, uh, they can use AAC to communicate with you know, the, the people, the hospital staff and, and family and caregivers uh, on a part-time basis or a temporary basis. Or you might have an autistic in individual who in certain settings and situations feels very overwhelmed or overstimulated and they're not able to access their, their speech uh, and they might use AAC to functionally communicate in different settings. And of Can course- I interrupt you? That, yeah. That's when you're, that's something that I think that comes up a lot is kids that might have a voice but they're unable to access it at times. And that's really the augmentative aspect then. So that's- yes. So that's really important that you guys are sharing this for me because when a parent is looking to have this put in place, they do hear sometimes, well, the kid has a voice. And so really to understand that there are these moments that they may not have access to their voice mm -hmm. and therefore it's augmentative, not alternative. Thank you for sharing that. Of course. Yes, and what we, we, we do hear that a lot, James, Jane, is that, oh, you know, he, he can speak. He, he uses speech um, and that's fantastic. But if those, that student's speech is not functional for them pretty much 100% of the time and across communication partners and environments, we might have to put something in place for them to be a competent communicator. We want our students, our children to be competent 
not just commuting, communicating with their most familiar partners, right? Um, we want them being able to communicate with strangers or with um, people that don't know them as well. So just because a student has speech doesn't mean they don't require AAC. They might need it in order to be a competent communicator across settings and partners. So EJ put this great uh, visual together for us, just again, just to differentiate the difference between um, assistive technology. And of course, there's a lot of overlap when you're accessing the curriculum and for communication. So we won't go into that too much, but it does kind of define and tease out um, AAC from more traditional assistive technologies. And just like, you know, assistive technology, um, AAC exists on a technology continuum, ranging from no technology all the way up through high technology. Um, the no technology aspect just refers to anything that is usually paper-based um, or that doesn't include any electronics at all. So this is just an example of a, a visual schedule um, that might be used to help support uh, a user's comprehension of, you know, what it is they're, they're, they're doing throughout their day using visual supports. In the middle here, you see light or mid technology. This is often referred to as low technology, which is a term that I used to use. Um, however, I no longer, I try not to use low technology anymore because I think it has this negative connotation to it. Like the word low somehow implies that it might not be as good as um, the other supports when in fact that nothing could be further from the truth for um, many users and many students light or mid technology is actually most appropriate or a very fundamental part of a communication system for an individual. So um, the biggest kind of takeaway from this slide would be don't discount light or mid tech. Um, it's incredibly important or, or no technology. And of course we have the, the high tech aspect which include the most electronics. There's usually some kind of charger that goes along with it, some kind of programming involved. Um, and it just has the most components that need to be maintained and, and uh, kept up with. So we'd love to hear from you just right now. Um, um, if you have, if your children are currently using AAC or if you're, uh, you know, I'm not 100% sure exactly who's on here, if there's some professionals on here, but what AAC are your children uh, using that you're familiar with? You can either unmute or raise your hand or drop it in the chat. Specific types of AAC that you have yeah. experience with. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So some very high tech, sophisticated AAC there. Anybody else? Okay, another Unity Accent 884 core boards. Okay, so we've got a, um, that's very high tech and then also some core boards, I'm assuming potentially low tech. Provider working with families, great. High tech as a supplement, mid tech, big, big Mac. Hi, Caitlin. And visual schedules, wonderful. And I'm curious, Jen, not to put you on the spot, you mentioned lamp words for life, but um, is there some uh, light and no tech uh, technology used as well? Uh, yes, I would say we, we use a lot of visuals and schedules and um, Previously, when he was a lot younger, we used PECS, like the um, picture exchange communication system. Um, yep. But you, you made me think of a question. Um, when is it appropriate for a student to have um, something like a core board that has a limited number of words um, versus access to all of the words? Um, because a question that we have, sometimes parents will have a team say that he, they're only ready for this many words. Um, what is the best practice for that? You want to take that one, EJ? Go ahead. So uh, the best practice in general is we need to give our students, our children access to robust vocabulary and robust language and communication. Um, the, but AAC in general is an entire system. And the system, and I think that might be next. Yes, it is right there. Oh, that, that worked out really well. Um, this is an example of uh, one potential system that could work uh, for a whole, for, for one student. You, so a student could use all of these potential supports as part of their communication system. 
Now, that doesn't mean that the student would always use um, their iPad with lamp, like I believe Renee is saying, in the pool, right? So, you, you, so it depends on the student and the student's environment, um, but we need to give them access to robust vocabulary at all times. Now, that's not always feasible, like I said, in terms of that high tech dynamic display, um, electronic device might not always be feasible or workable or preferred by that individual in particular settings. So that's why they need an entire system. But we start with core, you, or a student might have core vocabulary and access to it, which is wonderful, but they also need access to robust vocabulary as well. And I've never met a competent AAC user who doesn't use a wide variety of AAC supports. One more thing, just to chime in, um, if if a, a staff member or someone is is saying, well, they're not ready for any more words, I would I would counter that with, well, how do you know? And what what makes you think that or what makes you believe that? And it, we'll get into this in a, in a few slides, but this idea of presuming competence. Right, we really don't know, especially for you know our kiddos who are, are non-speaking. We really don't know what they're capable of, and we should always assume that they are capable of exactly what we want them to be capable of. Right, that's the least dangerous assumption. So, just another, another piece. That's great, EJ. Any questions about Jen loves this chart? That's good because EJ spent a lot of time. On <laughs> if you'd like a copy of this, I'm happy to share it with you. Just send me an email, and I can send you the PDF. I just it, put my email on the chat. Because I've been at PPTs where the child is a total communicator, you know, multiple forms of communication and different staff have different understandings of what that means. So some are saying, well, I don't want him to encourage verbal language because I want him to use his device. And, you know, the speech path gives a little bit of training. There are goals that do have him using the device in certain settings as a way to improve his use of the device. But outside of that, in those conditions they were trying to get him to broaden but outside of that we really want any and all methodology that the individual can employ successfully right just looking at yeah. this list like that whole blue column i use on a daily basis and probably most of yellow mm -hmm. oh yeah and a lot of the i use a lot of those purples that i use all my i wouldn't my visual supports my goodness, I wouldn't know what I'm doing next without my calendar and my visual support. So it's all part of comprehension and participation. Okay, so what is the ultimate goal of AAC? Go ahead, either unmute, raise hand, drop it in the chat. What is our goal? Authentic communication, interaction. Mm -hmm. And I take it a step further. What, what does authentic communication look like? Yep, Nicole, yep, independence. Independence. Independence in general is the goal of any assistive technology, but especially AAC. And I love this meaningful discourse. It's the student's voice, not just answering questions. Yes. So you guys got the independence, autonomy, connection. What it's not is compliance. It's not just answering questions. It's not, um, making a request because an adult wants you to. So again, moving on to, to, to some additional goals, um, very few restrictions on what a child can say. So that goes back to what you said, Jen, about the giving access to additional vocabulary. Well, if you only have a core board and, and core is wonderful, you could, you could communicate a ton of messages and we're gonna talk a little bit about core in a little bit. Um, but if you only have access to that, you're still pretty restricted. If you have a 16 message core board, 32 message today. 
um, a student is ultimately responsible for their own language and communication and they're able to express themselves in accordance with their own communicative intentions. Also, one of the main goals of using AAC, and this is a great um, article about SNUG from ASHA, is spontaneous novel utterance generation. And that stands for SNUG. So we want our students to be able to spontaneously communicate their own novel messages. My favorite example and of this is, sorry, were you gonna give an example? No, go ahead. No, nope, go for it. My favorite example of this is um, the spotted purple giraffe bounced on the beach ball until it popped. I've never said that sentence before in my whole life, but because I have the ability to generate snug, I can say whatever I want, whenever I want, exactly how I want. I always use the example. I remember my brother asked, he was like Mr. Question. And he asked when he was four years old, if there was more chipmunks than buffalo in the world. He actually asked us that question. I was 12 years old and I had to really, <laughs> we didn't really have the internet back then. But again, if he didn't have access to all those words, who would have known he was pondering the chipmunks versus buffalo? So we know that we need to have a communication system in place for our AAC users. But what does that look like? And how do we even go about planning it? What, do we, what are the things that we need to consider uh, when planning a communication system? Now, this is a very broad question, purposefully broad, uh, but please take a few seconds to either type in the chat or unmute yourself um, and, and brainstorm. What, what do we need to take into account when we're planning a communication system? Mobility and physical use of body. Yep, absolutely. Access, language, and vocabulary, for sure. Goals. What they demonstrate that they can do already. Yep, their existing skills. Their strengths. Receptive language, yep, absolutely. How comfortable the student is with the AAC, yeah. If they're not comfortable with it, if they're closed off, they're probably not gonna use it. You can advance, Nicole. Um, of the weight, if the device is and how to transport it. Yeah, absolutely, that's a, that's a big, a big question sometimes. Um, this is not an exhaustive list and I won't go through, you know, every single one, but the idea here is to really understand that, that the AAC process is very complex. It's not just slapping a device down in front of a student and then, you know, washing your hands and walking away. It's very, very complex and it really needs to be truly individualized, right? It's part of um, an individual's communication experience. And anything from, you know, the culture and ethnicity of the, the student and the, and the family all the way through fine and gross motor and how many symbols and where do you put them. Um, it can be overwhelming, but all of these things really do deserve to be looked at and considered when, when planning a system. And I love the, the family structure and the and fun and recreation too. And sometimes in the schools, we don't always, um, team as well as we should um, with the family and, and um, making sure um, that whatever we recommend or whatever um, is going to be used works for the family structure. Do you think also here we include, um, like you wanna make sure the family structure's there, but also like the classroom. I know a lot of parents are always trying to get the peers on the device so that they can come home and say, I played baseball with Johnny. I did this with these kids. So I don't know what you'd call that, but um, you know, other people in their lives. Yeah, communication partners and their environment for sure. Yep. So uh, another thought question for you. 
Um, what are the prerequisites needed to be an AAC user? What has to be in place before someone can start to use AAC to be alive, breathing? People are looking ahead on the slides <laughs> or <laughs> people know. <laughs> yeah, you're absolutely right there. You can, you can advance the slide. There are no prerequisites. As long as you are alive and breathing, you are a candidate for AAC. Um, and it, it ties right into that presumed competence um, idea that I was talking about earlier. You can go to the next one. Um, presumed competence is a, is a hashtag you can find on social media where people are having discussions about this idea. Um, but again, this idea of presuming competence is it's, it's dangerous to assume that a child or a human being cannot accomplish something. Um, you're, you're really cutting their legs off before they can walk. Um, and it's, it's always best practice to assume that they are capable of learning, um, you know, how to communicate, uh, using a system of communication. And, and if they're not able to, you know, communicate or, or use the device in the way that you expect, that's okay. But at least you've given the opportunity to, to do so. So we did want to uh, dispel some myths. This one we uh, added in because um, we um, we were just talking, uh, Jane and Jen and EJ and I, right before about some of the other myths that we didn't think of uh, right before this presentation, What, which is we do hear, and it's really more of a practice barrier in the schools that you, um, students aren't allowed to bring their AAC device home. Um, that is, um, a myth. Okay. Does someone have a, a Renee comment? has a comment. Renee? Okay. I'll pause. Go ahead, Renee. Sorry. I didn't, I can't find the raise hand icon. I'm like, it's missing. So I, I just wanted to thank you for, for saying about the presuming competence. Um, my daughter is going into eighth grade in for numerous years, really up until last year, it was always assumed that she was at a particular level and things she couldn't do. And um, COVID really was a bonus for us. It, we ended up in a, in a different realm and being virtual and um, some new team members. And they came to the table day one, assuming she could do everything. And I loved when the teacher said, oh girl, I have to step up my game. You already got all of this. So I, I just wanted to reiterate that for any professionals that are on here you know, the bar, super, super high. So thank you for saying it. Awesome, I love hearing that. Um, and, and so I would imagine, of course, um, Renee and, and anybody else listening, um, if your child didn't have access to their device at home or their AAC system at home, uh, she or he would not be able to make progress um, towards their IEP goals and objectives. And that is when we start talking about um, technicalities, of course, um, when we look at the law and IDEA, if a student needs a particular assistive technology uh, device or tool in order to make progress towards their IEP goals and objectives, they should be able to bring it home. And so that's not just about AAC, that's also about reading and writing and organization and all of those other domains of education. But clearly um, AAC is the easiest one because we don't just communicate and work towards our, our IEP goals and objectives in the seven or eight hours that we're at, at school. Um, our students need access to their devices, um, their systems 24 hours a day when possible. And that's not to say, you know, I do have some students who communicate very differently at home or do use different methods at home versus school, but they still have access to their entire system as needed. And the, the family is also the thing that's going to remain constant, usually in that student's life versus, you know, they might start out with one team who really knows the communication system very well. And the next year you've got to, you've got to spend time training that team all over again, because it's new to them. But the family, if the family is on board, if that device or that system's going home back and forth, and that's functional, that's really what's going to set the student up for, for the most success. 
So we wanted to dispel a few more myths about AAC. We've heard in the past, um, children must demonstrate certain skills to benefit from symbols or from AAC. We've heard, oh, they, um, a student needs to use PECS, the picture exchange communication system before moving to high tech. Um, we've heard it all and it's not true. Um, of course, we have to consider our students um, visual access to symbols and AAC devices and their physical and motor access, but there are no prerequisites. There's no real hierarchy of certain skills a student needs um, in order to benefit from symbols or AAC. I'm just looking at the chat. I think it's important to know that the family does not need to be the one to purchase the device. Um, yes, that's true. So um, in general, what we, we might as well talk about that now, the district is the payee of last resort, meaning if the PPT agrees that a student needs um, an iPad, let's just say for communication, the district can ask and is within their rights to ask the family if they would like it cover, you know, if they would like to try to purchase it personally or have it covered through medical insurance if it's um you know a medical device like a Di toby dynavox or something like that however if the parent does not want to do that for whatever reason does not want to go through their insurance or purchase it personally because the ppt has indicated this is something the student needs for their iep to make progress and for their communication then the district does have to provide that device so under the technical rules of things and law, um, the district is the payee of last resort. They are within their rights to ask. And there are for sure benefits for families. And I think you said that there, Renee, that there was a benefit for you to do it. Um, there are certainly pros and cons, especially when our, our children are getting older and about to graduate for them to have their own personally purchased device. So it is within the district's um, purview to ask. However, if that's not going to work for the family, for whatever reason, the district still has to provide that device. Any questions about that? Okay. There is this other myth too, and it, um, and actually, when I went to grad school, I went, I studied under Janice Light at Penn State. Uh, university. She's one of the, the most amazing AAC people you'll ever meet. Um, and we did do a symbol assessment back then. And this was in 2000 to 2002 um, to see what our students um, could understand slash um, what, what felt was the most appropriate symbol. Um, but really that it is really a myth. Um, students can understand um, symbols um, throughout the hierarchy, and we don't have to move through them. We used to think that we would have to start with um, pictures and then move all the way up to color line drawings. That's not really true. That is a myth. And what is true is, of course, some symbols are more are easier to understand than others. And so students need to be presented with them consistently over time, and they will learn them. And we don't want to sit and wait to teach a student on because the symbol for on is a box with a dot or whatever it's going to be because it's abstract. It's one of the best ways to teach on. You could teach on doing movement and, you know, oh, we're on the table. And then you could be pointing to the actual symbol for on. And that's how we learn and that's how we teach. So it helps actually learn concepts and language. And again, another myth, AAC or symbols um, are only used as a last resort. If our student isn't using speech, um, if we've tried every single thing else, um, that is a myth. Once we start seeing that our students um, are, are not able to communicate across a variety of partners um, and a, with a variety of messages and vocabulary, we want to start with AAC. The sooner we start it, the better for those students. And then the last one that we see a lot, um, and again, if you have other myths that you want to dispel or any questions, please put it in the chat or raise your hand, but is that symbols or AAC is going to inhibit speech development. 
we still hear this. And it goes kind of back to what Jane was saying before about even if a student has speech, sometimes we're not using AAC, um, but we need to if they're not competent communicators across partners and environments. AAC has never been shown to inhibit speech development. In fact, it's been shown in the, um, in the past to help enhance communication, but it's certainly never inhibited speech. And there are, these are four links um, to some, um, two of them are uh, AAC companies that have some really good um, information out there and it's not their research. They point you to the peer reviewed uh, communication research out there for AAC. So um, whenever we hear that, we always talk about how, of course, we want to use a student speech whenever possible. Uh, speech is quick and easy and effective and efficient. However, if it's not working um, and they're not competent communicators with just speech, we still want to use some type of AAC. So the question that we probably get asked most often and, and really getting at the, the meat of this presentation are, are, you know, what are the best practice strategies to implement AAC? And there are um, a number of them. Uh, we've listed eight here. We're not gonna go through every single one. We're gonna go through uh, number three and four um, in, in more detail, but I will just briefly go through the other ones. And, and as Nicole said before, there are links to uh, external resources if you are interested in, in one area that we're not gonna take a little bit of a deep dive into. So the first one, utilize a whole communication system. We talked about that earlier. If you remember that graphic that um, I promised to send if you send me an email, um, a communication system is really the, the goal for AAC. We don't want to rely on, on one part of that system. We want, uh, we want um, a whole host of um, options for our users. The second option or the second strategy here is um, be a good communication partner. So you know, what, what does that mean? Um, if you click on this link here, it'll take you to um, 12 strategies and, and suggestions on how to be a good communication partner. Patience is a big one. Um, it just physically takes longer to use AAC to select a message and, or select buttons. Um, and so patience is, is, you know, one of the strategies that they discuss and, and there's a number of others as well. Three is customize the vocabulary, right? We want each communication system to be unique to the user and to have words and symbols and pictures that are unique to them and their preferences and you know, what they wanna communicate about. Um, so if you click on this link, it will take you to a survey or a questionnaire. Uh, there's actually two different ones. And um, the, the team, the school team can go through it and really take a deep dive into, you know, what are the different settings that the student is in, uh, both in their school day and at home, and what are all the vocabulary, both, um, you know, very specific vocabulary, but also core vocabulary that really need to be on the system for the user. Number four is use aided language stimulation and modeling. Um, hugely, hugely important for teaching and uh, the growth of AAC. We'll get into this in a couple of different slides. Number five is use appropriate prompting. If you click on this link, it will take you to a podcast, um, the, the Talking with Tech podcast. It's an excellent episode, but if you go to time 1230, they have a really uh, thoughtful, in-depth discussion about prompting, and they make an argument that, you know, if you're using hand-over-hand -hand prompting uh, for an extended period of time when using AAC and teaching AAC, there's reasons where to believe that, you know, you're not really providing any, any support for independence. If you're constantly using hand over hand prompting, that's not, um, that's not something that's ideal for, for AAC implementation. So I, I love that podcast and encourage you to go listen to it. If podcasts are your thing. Number six is coaching for all communication partners. Um, a lot of times we'll, we'll deliver information in, you know, a presentation or a workshop, uh, like this one. Um, but, but, but that's not what research shows us that has the most impact on practice. Um, and a, a person with, um, you know, AAC expert and, and, and knowledge in AAC actually going into a school and working with teams and having an opportunity to, you know, set goals for the, the staff member and, and having a coaching relationship. That's often what, what really makes a difference and coaching the family. 
Um, so coaching is, it becomes a, a huge piece of this as well. EJ, I just wanted to interrupt. And, and within IDEA, when you talk, when, when you look at assistive technology and the services districts are supposed to provide or um, um, under IDEA, training of family is absolutely explicitly written in there and spelled out. So families have the right to receive training in AAC in the assistive technology that your, your children are using. Mm -hmm. Um, number seven is one of my favorites. Uh, we want to create engaging communication opportunities, right? Um, if a child or a student looks at the AAC device and knows that an interrogation is coming or rapid fire questions are coming, that's not engaging, right? And that's not even really communication. It's just a, a monologue really, or an interrogation. Um, we're going to show this quick video um, from Rachel Madel. She's an SLP in private practice out in California who uh, does a lot of AAC work. And she has this mantra, this mantra called inspire, don't require. I love this video. Um, and I think you will too. Oops. Sorry about that. Give me a second. There we go. When I'm coaching communication partners, I love to use the phrase inspire, don't require. Children with complex communication needs spend most of their days being told what to do sit down, come here, don't touch. The last thing they need is a demand for communication. Instead, as adults, it's our responsibility to inspire children to communicate. If you think about what motivates us as adults to communicate, it's things that are interesting and exciting and weird and surprising and silly. Those are the types of activities we need to create for children because that's what will inspire a child to communicate in a way that's authentic and not artificial or scripted. My best sessions are the ones where kids are smiling and laughing from activities that are so awesome that kids are intrinsically motivated to communicate about them. It's in these moments that children learn the true power of language. So like I said, I, I just love that video because I think it breaks down um, exactly why we're introducing AAC, right? It's not, AAC is not compliance. We're not um, demanding that, that a student uses AAC. We need to show them the power of AAC and the power of communication and, and inspire them to use it. Um, and that comes, that, that work comes from the adults surrounding the student. And the last one is provide consistent access. I think we touched on this a little bit before, but you know, the key word here being consistent, um, meaning the device should travel wherever the student travels, uh, both within the school should go to specials and lunch and recess and field trips. Um, and it should go home with the student. Um, the device should be charged, should be, if it's, if it's electronic, it should be um, maintained and, and just accessible to the student at all times. And we put their babbling in words uh, because actually Jen, we had a conversation with Jen right before about how um, providing consistent access means also letting your student explore the device and, and use words and babble with it um, and get that communication interaction. Um, and they can't do that if the device is taken away or not provided throughout the day, or we've hidden certain words that the student loves to say, um, which might not always be, make the most sense in context, but they need to be taught the appropriate communication strategies. I also think maybe sometimes people feel when kids are exploring it, that they're not using it correctly because they're not using it to communicate with someone, but they're playing with the words and their, their comprehension, as you pointed out earlier, is what they're working on. Yep, yep. And Renee said stimming, right? And Renee, I'll, um, I'll, I'll talk about your myth before, Renee. But yes, we like to encourage explore time. I like to call it explore time. Oh, you're exploring your device. Um, and then, so, of course, we want to communicate with it and shape those, that, those, those explorations as communication. But it's always good to talk about, oh, you're exploring your device. You're looking at it. Um, and then it also kind of is helpful later if you know they're asked a question and then they might, and your student might be not necessarily um, participating appropriately. You could say, oh, it looks like you're exploring now, but I, I wondered if you're hungry, you know, so you can kind of have a label for that so that your students know, oh, I, um, I need to tell mom if I'm hungry or not right now. 
just in terms of, you know, looking at this through an equity lens too, it's a lot easier for students who use AAC to be at a disadvantage when it comes to this, right? If you have a student who's primarily verbal or uses oral speech and they're stimming, stimming verbally or orally with their voice, you would never run up to them and cover their mouth or you would never, you know, put tape over their mouth. Um, and just like, you know, with an AAC user, you would never take away their device. You'd never delete vocabulary that you don't want to hear anymore because it's not yours to delete. And um, so I believe it was Renee who talked about another myth about behavior. They need to demonstrate they can handle it, right? That, that is a myth. Um, our students need access to communication. If, if they can't you know, use uh, their own, their, their, their speech effectively or other communication um, methods. Um, so we we'll just go through the next two strategies. We wanted to leave the last five minutes for any other questions or comments. Um, we, we said we would talk about the customization of vocabulary. We did talk about core words. We mentioned them. Essentially, core is critically important um, because it's really all that we say. We say when, we, when we're speaking, we say about 75 to 80% of the vocabulary that we use is core and everything else is fringe. So we want to make sure that um, we have robust generalizable vocabulary on our students' devices. And that's what um, Jen has you know, with the lamp and someone else mentioned another Unity device that is very core based. And of course there's a need for fringe as well. Um, and I love this example because with core, um, look what you can say, stop, want, go, play, Minecraft, big brother. So three quarters of that is core, two fringe words and brothers probably core a little bit later on. But then if you only use fringe, George iPad. The and one of our other critical strategies, sorry, EJ, go ahead. That's okay, um, is aided language stimulation is kind of the, the formal term. You might also hear it as modeling. Um, essentially what modeling is, it's a strategy where the communication partner will select or touch the words or the buttons that they are speaking at the same time that they're speaking them on a communication system, preferably their own, right? Especially if the, the user uh, has you know feelings of strong ownership for their device. Um, and this is really giving the student uh, a chance to learn, you know, how language is structured and, 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 you know, where the words are and how to combine words together. Um, it's basically teaching them this, this alternative or augmentative way to communicate. Um, it's arguably one of the most powerful strategies to successful AAC use. Um, and to do this, you really need to know the device, right? You can't just, you can just pick it up and start exploring. And, and that's what I do. Um, often when I, you know, I'm working with a student for the first time, I'll kind of talk through, I wonder where fish would be. It's probably in animals and, 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 you know, not being afraid to make mistakes as well. Uh, super quick. I know we're, we're running out of time here, um, but I love this excerpt from uh, Senate and et al. So a neurotypical baby experiences about 4,500 hours of oral language by the time they're one and a half. If we have an AAC user that's only exposed to modeling on their device for an hour a week, like you know, typically the amount of speech that they receive per week, it's going to take them 84 years to get that same exposure as that 18 month old, if the SLP is the only one providing this modeling. And so the take home here is it can't just fall on one staff member or family member or one person to provide this modeling. It's got to be a team effort. Um, you really need to immerse that child in a world that speaks AAC in order to expect them to start speaking AAC. And, um, oh, so we're not going to show this video, but something we did want to, oh, and then it, it's auto playing. Sorry about that. Something we did want to talk about in terms of modeling. And Lisa, we, I see your question, um, is that we've, we've heard that some districts, um, or that students might only have one device. And um, the issue there is, especially if the student is using the device and we want to model and they have ownership over it or don't want you to touch the device, 
or if it just works better for modeling, um, it is okay to provide and sometimes good practice to provide a separate device that people are modeling on. So there's, and then, so we have some students that have their own device for communication, another device that the staff is using for modeling. And then they might even have a third device depending on the student to access assistive technology and the curriculum. Oftentimes we like to um, could have one device just associated with communication so that student knows that that's their voice and that's the way they can communicate and they don't see it as an academic demand as opposed to when we're using some type of other device for academics. Um, so we wanted to make sure that we, we, we are seeing that now more often where districts are providing a separate modeling device and for sure two separate devices for the students, one for communication and one for um, access to the curriculum. That's not to say some students can't handle a device with both. I do have some students who are clicking back and forth through their, with their AEC device or have a split screen and they're using the app for communication and then have apps up for academics. So it does depend on the student, it's very student specific, but we just wanted to mention both of those practices. And so um, before we finish, EJ, I just want, I definitely wanted to get to Lisa's question. So AAC and ESL is a second language. Can the AAC be used in the primary language and can the school demand an ESL student use it in English? Hmm. I'm trying to understand the question too. So. If a student say, so is the primary language not English, I'm assuming then Lisa in this ask, yeah. in this respect? In this, yeah, maybe, and I did probably didn't word it the most appropriate way I'm trying to get my thought onto, but if a student's primary language is Spanish and they use an AAC device, can the AAC be programmed in their primary language? And then second question is, how would that work if they were doing an ESL course? at school, can the school demand that the AAC be utilized only in English or in that case, would they have two devices? How would that work? It's a good question. So the first part is there are some devices that are multilingual and that can easily speak a few languages. Um, I'm trying to think off the top of my head, Sp I know Spanish, French, EJ, do you know some of the other ones? I'm trying to, and if That's anybody like else knows. French. Yeah. Um, and those are only certain apps and certain devices that could do both. Now, the second piece is that, so then that's part of the team process and ensuring that the device that's chosen for the student works in both languages. Um, now, the other piece is, can the school demand it being used in English? I mean, I guess my question would be what would typically happen for that ESL um, lesson? Would they be expected to speak in English or Spanish? I guess that's my first question. It, for absent of the AAC device. I think for my question, I guess, because like if it's in English, they're learning in English, would they be expected to give the answer in, can they demand that it be given in English versus them, because it's in English, they're trying to, you know, teach them English as a second language. Right. Hmm. That's a tricky one. I've never really had that come up. So I know that there are devices that you can say it. So if say it's um, shoe in Spanish, and they touch the picture, it could say it in Spanish and English, but I don't know about switching it all to English, especially when it's going to be symbol-based anyway. Do you know what I mean? I do, yeah, thank you. It's a good question, Lisa, and it, I also yeah. might depend on where the child is in their, um, as an English language learner, where they are in that process, because that's a limited process. But if you need a really good answer, please call us. We'd be happy to work with you on getting a really good answer. Yeah. We all feel confident. I think it's going to be very specific to the situation. Right. Okay. Appreciate yeah. it. And just thinking back to like your slide on, I know we're almost out of time, but thinking back to the slide of like, if the, you know, the, the device is being used 
between school and home and if the family's primary language is Spanish, we can't send them home with an AAC device that speaks English, so. Correct. Good yes. point. And that's, you absolutely need to know that about the, the student um, and, the, and the language spoken at home. And then I have some families where they speak Mandarin at home, um, but they also speak English and they've said to me, it's okay that the device, you know, so you just have to work with the family that the device is just in English. It just depends on the family and the, and the needs. But. Well, thank you everyone. Does anyone have any other questions before we wrap up? And I know the bit.ly was in the um, chat to be able to access the slides. Thank you. And there, there it is again. So you have access to all of the resources that were provided. Thank you very much for all of those resources. And you are welcome to call us if you want to follow up on anything. And we will certainly reach out to these guys if we need their answers. So thank you. Do you guys thank have any you all. words? Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yep. Make sure to click on all the links. There's tons of resources there. Thank you all for participating.